Hey, today let's look at uh, four different kings. We're going to look at four different kings today. And I uh, want to just kind of look at those, look at the man of the people. Uh, let's look today, the man of the people, number one, King Saul. Let's look at King Saul. So we've got King, you know, we could have went King of Hearts, King of Spades. That would have been weird. But hey, let's go, uh, let's go Saul and the Amalekites. So I want to explain something to you. Saul, uh, Saul is a good dude. I mean, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want us to always be harsh on, on Saul because, you know, he, he lost the kingdom to David. Uh, not that he lost it to David. He just lost it from God and he lost his anointing from God. And, uh, I will say this much. I believe uh, that Samuel really loved Saul. I believe he really enjoyed uh, uh, speaking into his life and, and, and watching him grow. And I really believe that because, of, you know, Saul was grieved. I mean, Samuel was grieved over some, some situations with Saul. So let's, th this is kind of where it starts to come apart for Saul. We're going to look at the Amalekites and the battle. That, that, that was being prepared for it. We're going to look at the Philistines. So let's look at Saul and, and, and the Amalekites. First Samuel chapter 15, verse three. Don't look at the screens because we're not going to have that on there for you. So you got to get your Bible this time. It's like weird, right? So, uh, first Samuel chapter 15, three. Now go and strike Amalek. So this is the Amalekites. And there's a story here, and we just can't get it all fit in, so so we're going to kind of go. So now go and strike the, uh, Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. This is a harsh order. I mean, this is a this is a tough order. So let me just explain how this looks to us in our lives today. Uh, uh, find the sin that you have in your life and kill every bit of it root and all. Get in there deep. And, I mean, if you leave any anything that it's going to come back later. So, I mean, this sounds really harsh. So let's move on. Verse four. So Saul summoned the people and he numbered them at Tel Ain and 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. So 210,000 soldiers who basically we'll call them swordsmen. So the, these are warriors uh, uh, that, 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 you know, could be warriors. This, is, this was his army. So this is, what, this is what Saul has done here. Saul has, it, we're, creating, we're creating, creating the story. Saul has literally uh, counted. He's put his faith and his trust in what he has. So we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to show you where we're going in just a second. But I want to know if I'm going into battle, I want to know what kind of force I have. So we're going to see this again in a minute. But in verse 9, we'll, we'll move on from there. But Saul and the people spared Agag. Agag is the king. So, uh, so Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and of the lambs, all that was good. And would not utterly they and would not utterly destroy them, but I'm going to put a but in there. There's not one in there. All that was despised and worth, worthless. They devoted to destruction. So everything that was sick and ugly and 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 and, and pitiful and and of no value, they, they they killed it. They killed all those. But let's go back to verse three. Devote to destruction everything. Men, women, donkeys, cattle, every, everything that makes the noise, everything that breathes the breath, everything that has a face. Kill it. So, so, you know, he, there's a difference between doing what God calls you to do and doing what you do. I mean, God may say, I want you to do this. This is, this is my commandment to you. And here is your commandment and it is to do this. But somehow or another, we rewrite that to satisfy ourselves. Because you know what, you, do you know what the, they, they really wanted? They wanted trophies. Because the, the best of the sheep, they're trophies. The best of the cattle, they're trophies. The best of the kingdom, which is the king, is a trophy. It, it, it's, it's look at me and look what I did. So, verse 15. Now, now we've, got, we've got Saul, Samuel's confronted him, and Saul has can, you know, kind of basically tried to create a, 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 a narrative. And he's tried to defend himself. He's tried to explain why this is. So he's, you know, he's got this whole narrative going on. And he's, he's like, but look what I did. Look what I did. I did this. I did everything you said. No, I, you didn't do everything we said. You didn't do what God said. You did portions of what God said. You filled in the blanks as to what you think would be 
fulfilling for the rest of it. So now Saul has just gotten, I mean, Samuel's gotten very hard with him. And Saul says this, Saul said, they, <laughs> where'd they come in? They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to your God. Now, all of a sudden, we've got, we, we, why is it all of a sudden Samuel's God? Why is it not my God? Why is it, why is he not your God, Saul? But to your God, he says, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. So God says, do this. We've done all this and the rest we've devoted to destruction. So we did almost everything you said. That should be good enough, right? No, it's not. So uh, notice the words, they and the people. There's always a, there's always a they we can blame something on. There's always a the people we can blame something on. Verse 21, but the people, there it is again, the people took of the spoils. He's explaining again, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I, I'm trying my best to do, I'm trying to lead these people, but they did it. They did, I did, I had no idea about it. They did it. They took the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to your God at Gilgal. So now I've, I've even got another lie to cover up another lie. So now I've got, I've got, he's got this scenario. You, they took, this is what they wanted to do though. Hey, they wanted to honor you, the Lord. And this was going to be a, we were going to sacrifice these animals at Gilgal before the Lord. Well, we don't know that that's true or we don't know that it's not true. But we, what we do know is this, this, you know, I think, I think it's another uh, uh, excuse upon top of another excuse. And I'm, Saul's trying to pass the buck, but they, but they, there's always a they. So notice again in verse 21, but they took, but the people took. Saul took glory in the victory but tried to pass blame to the people when God called him on his disobedience. I, you know, I mean, this is classic us. I mean, don't be so hard on Saul. I, I mean, I, I really think that, that, that he's a good guy, but not every good guy can be a good leader. So I think he's a really good guy. And let me erase this thing. So uh, verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. So now finally, He's not getting out of it. The jig is up. So finally he realizes I am, I'm, I'm in this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. I can't get out of it. So Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned. I'm sorry. I, I, I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord uh, and your words because here's the reason. In, in other words, I have, I'm still trying to divert. I sinned and I transgressed, other, but I feared the people and obeyed their voice. See, this is, this is the man of the people. This is what the man of the people, whoever's words control our thoughts becomes our God. So, so, so if the enemy's, you know, voice is the loudest, then the enemy's voice is the one that's going to be our God. If the people's voice was the loudest, you know, obviously the word of the Lord came through Samuel to Saul and Saul said, I couldn't hear what you were saying. I couldn't concentrate on what you were saying. I couldn't follow what you were saying because I was afraid of their voice. So whoever's voice, whoever's words control our thoughts becomes our God. Saul created a smoke screen of lies to Samuel until he reached a point to where, hey, the jig is up. I'm sorry here, but the jig is up. And then he began to start passing blame. So at first, I, he's trying to convince him of everything he done was right. And then all of a sudden, he's trying to convince him, him of, of now I did right, but they did wrong. And, and now I, I'm, a, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please, don't allow, please tell the Lord not to turn on me. But they again. So, so he became a man of the people. And sometimes a man of the people is not exactly the man of God. He's not, he's not the man of the devil. He's just not a man of God. So let's, let's jump back a little bit. Let's look at Saul against the Philistines. So 1 Samuel chapter 13, we're going to bump back to two chapters, verses 11 and 12. Samuel said, what have you done? What have you done? Because this is what he has said. God has said, wait, Samuel will come 
And basically, we'll, we'll, we'll have sacrifice. We'll, we'll do the, the we'll, basically, we'll have church before we move out. We'll have laying on of hands before we move out. So, uh, so Samuel didn't come when Saul thought he should be there. So Samuel now has walked up and he says, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me. Now see, once again, he's, he's, he's being driven by fear. And that you did not come, you know, it's, it's your fault, dude. You didn't come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. In verse 12, I said, I said, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself. Man, I love it. I forced myself to worship. I forced myself to do what, what God does. I forced myself to please the people. I forced myself to do this because the people were leaving. Remember, this is a different battle, but remember, he's got a couple of hundred thousand soldiers. And I, he, when, we place our, we, we, when we place our faith and our trust in what we have, then when what we have leaves, then we will have no faith and trust in anything else. So now he's concerned. Now he's, you know, they were going, so I forced myself and offered the burnt offering myself. I just did it myself. You didn't come when I thought you should, so I just, I forced myself. Saul was instructed by God to wait upon Samuel to make the sacrifice. Basically, I, I, I am, I, he is my conduit to you. Wait and seek God for the victory that God himself had sent them only through Samuel. Samuel didn't arrive on the scene quicker than the people were losing heart. See, here's the thing. Sometimes God's just not moving faster than we think people are losing heart. In other words, God just wasn't moving fast enough. God just not quick enough to suit me, so I'm going to do it myself. So the man of the people made his own sacrifice, created his own doctrine, was more afraid of the approaching enemy than he was of approaching God. See, when God says, I want you to wait seven days, let's, I mean, let's really try hard to wait seven days. It's hard to wait seven days on the Lord when something has to be done now. That's hard. To, when we see, you know, in other words, I want you to wait seven days to pay that bill. You have $1,000. The bill's $1,002. I want you to wait seven days. And then all of a sudden, dollars are going out, you know, and hemorrhaging. And then all of a sudden, I better pay it right now. If I don't pay it right now, I'm not going to have it in seven days. See, let's just bring it home a little bit, you know. So the numbers just weren't adding up. It's just not adding up in his mind here. So in other words, when we mathematically can't figure it out, then we just figure it out on our own. But see, the thing is, God's not ever going to be mathematically figured out. The Philistines had, con had a confident army. These guys felt good about themselves. These, I mean, they had weapons. Israel really didn't. They had 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen and troops. This is a pretty good looking army. So intimidating of a force that a lot of Saul's army had fled. I, too big, too bad. I'm not sticking around. They're hiding in rocks or go, uh, between rocks or going in holes, cisterns. I mean, they're hiding, they're leaving, they're running away. So with every passing day, the numbers are not adding up. Saul is getting a report, I'm sure. He, I don't think he's doing it himself. He's getting a report every day and all of a sudden it's not adding up and it's getting worse. You don't have 200,000 soldiers anymore. You got 150,000 soldiers. Hey, it's getting worse. Now you have 135,000 soldiers. But see, that, that Philistine army still looks as good as they did the day they walked up. So everything flows down from leadership. Everything. As goes the leader, so goes the army, so goes the team, so goes the church. Everything flows down from leadership. As goes the couple, the, the marriage, so goes the family. So everything flows down from leadership. Saul was afraid, so Israel became afraid. I mean, you know, it, it's not hard to see. So let's make a note to ourselves. I just want to make a note to ourselves. And please do yourself a favor here. Please, in the future, don't focus on how large your enemy is. Because he's always going to be a big dude. It's always going to be a big situation. He will always be bigger than, than you. Real, I mean, it's, it's, he's always going to have 30,000 chariots. He's always going to have 6,000 foot soldiers uh, and, and horses. 
but rather let's focus on how much larger God is than our problem. Because if God's not saying something or moving, it's, it's for a reason. Sometimes God's just not going to do anything. Sometimes it's, it, we're, we're, we're going to have to wait and we have no choice. But here's, I mean, I, wouldn't it be great if God would do what we asked him to do when we asked him to do it? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be awesome if God just did the way we thought he ought to do? Well, you know, that'd make me God, not him. And so I'm, I'm not good at being God, trust me. Whatever we fear, what we fear most controls our thoughts. What controls our thoughts becomes our God. So let me say it again. What we fear most controls our thoughts because you say, I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah, it will completely consume your thoughts. And what consumes our thoughts uh, becomes our God. So, so it, 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 it's just a cycle that we can't get out of. So Saul acted in fear and it cost him his whole kingdom. It cost him his relationship with, 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 uh, with his, uh, his, his country. It cost him his lineage. It cost him everything. It cost him uh, uh, his reputation. It cost him his favor with God. It cost him his pres- the, the Lord's presence with him. It cost him everything because he acted in fear. So the man of the people, number two, different king. We're going to jump to a different king, King David. So you say, all right, now we're going to get some good king stuff going on. Well, King David messed up too. First Chronicles chapter 13, verses one through three. David consulted, first Chronicles 13, one through three. David consulted right, right there, right here. We we got, we have an issue. David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and every leader. So in other words, David didn't go down, down on, 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 uh, you know, second street and turn left and go knock on that one little widow woman's door and say, hey, what do you think? We always want to ask the leaders, the most powerful. We want to ask the the people who we think will make a difference. So he went to the leaders and David said to all of them, verse two, uh, he said, if it seems good to you, what do you think? If it seems good to you, Oh, oh, and from our, our Lord, our God, let us send abroad to our brothers who reign in all the lands of Israel, as well as the priests and the Levites in the cities uh, uh, that have pasture lands, and that they may gather to us, verse 3, then let us bring again the ark of God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. Okay, we got a problem. We've got a problem if the tangible presence of the Lord has not been in the camp during the entire prior administration. So we didn't seek the presence of the Lord the entire time that Saul was in charge, which was a lot of years. And where is it? Well, where, where is the presence? Where's the ark? See, this was, they had to have something tangible. So it was the ark. It was, it was so big, so wide, all this stuff, gold, cherubim at the top, the, the mercy seat inside of it was, you know, uh, the tablets and, and, and manna and, and Aaron's rod that budded, all this stuff. So it was their tangible presence that God would, God, God would literally, his presence was hovered there between that, between those cherubim. So David's like, I'm doing a good thing. Let's go get the presence of the Lord. Let's go get the ark of the Lord. Where is the ark of the Lord? Well, the last time I remember the ark of the Lord, it was stolen. Well, not stolen. It was, it was taken in battle by the Philistines. Oh, oh yeah. Philistines have our God. (laughs) Okay. The Philistines have my God. The enemy has control of my God. Let me show you how, let me, let me just give you a quick little tutorial here. If you think that a pagan or, or, or the world has control over God. I'm going to show you what it looks like. They brought the presence of the Lord. Hey, this is the absolute crown jewel of the Israel, Israeli army. We cannot, we will not win, lose another battle. They got cancers. They got tumors, pestilences. They finally stuck it on a new cart, put some, put some gold trophies with it and stuck it out at the edge of the property and said, please get this out of our, I don't want to see it ever again. If we disrespect the presence of the Lord, then this is how we'll treat the presence of the Lord. Just get the presence of the Lord away from me. So, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3. We're jumping back to 2 Samuel. Verse 6, chapter 6, verse verse 3. So, David says, what do you guys think? Should we go get the presence of the Lord? Is this a good idea? You think it's a good idea? Okay, let's all do this. Verse 6, verse 3. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart. Like... The Philistines did. 
See, David was, was has recently become king. He's, you know, we looked a couple of weeks ago, the men of the city, he's already conquered. Jerusalem couldn't be done. He took the city, set up, set it up as his basically capital. Now he wants the, the presence of the Lord. You know what? We're not a city. We're not a, we're, we're not the, the children of the king w- without the presence of the king. So we're going to go get the presence of the Lord and get him back here. So let's go get, I know it sounds weird, but that's, that, that was the protocol at that particular time. So they went to the, uh, uh, to, to get the ark of the Lord. So it, you know, we go after it, but he asked the people what they thought. What do you think? What do you think we should do? He loaded the tangible presence of God on an ark, uh, on a cart like the pagan enemy carried their gods. In other words, we're just going to carry God, the creator of the universe, the lover of my soul, the forgiver of my sins, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to carry him like we carry everything else. Just just like everything else. See, we, 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 we God's never going to be casual in our lives. So we're going, when we carry the presence of the Lord like the world carries the presence of the Lord, it's going to cost people their lives. It cost a man his life. Let's go back to First Chronicles chapter 13, verse 8. They went before the Lord and worship. I'm kind of paraphrasing this. Man, they went before the Lord and worship, having a little church. See, we got some church stuff going on. We've got, we're bringing what we think because see, the thing is, notice that because we never sought the, our, the presence of the Lord during Saul's administration. So we don't know how to get the presence of the Lord back. So how, how do we transport the ark of God? Philistines do it. Let's just do it like they do it. So in other words, you and I can't learn how to worship the Lord from the world. We can't learn how to worship the Lord from watching TV. So, so I mean, you know, we can't work. You know what? Do you, you guys notice these kids come in here during worship and they pray with people? They're learning how to worship the Lord for people who worship the Lord, not from something else. So verse 9 and 10, I'm going to paraphrase it again. Cart stumbles, Uzzah or Uzzah, he reaches out to steady. Dude was just trying, just trying to do a good thing. Bang, God strikes him dead. David freaks out. So we're, you know, we're, we're in route and we're, we're not there. David left the presence of God on the side of the road for three months. This is freaking out when you leave the presence of God on the side of the road. A guy named Obed-Edom, and, you know, it's, it's like, let's just say it's in his front yard. The presence of the Lord is in Obed-Edom's front yard. And we're like, don't come out here. Don't go around it. Don't let your kids play on it because this thing will kill everybody. And then all of a sudden, he's blessed beyond measure. David inquired of the people. And the people, the, the people didn't know either. See, we can't ask the people to give us an answer that only God can give us. They mixed a little worship with a little pagan new cart mentality and David became a man of the people just like that. He just, I mean, you know, just see, let me just give you a challenge here. You, your wife, you, 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 you know, you guys together, you guys are the priest of your home. So let me show you what this looks like. TikTok preachers are, are not, they don't need to be speaking into your life. Do you realize when you see a TikTok preacher, he's sitting in, he's probably sitting in his back room with a curtain behind him and a camera. But the man doesn't even have a congregation. And we're living on this guy's words. YouTube, YouTube services don't, YouTube services aren't going to speak into your life. The friends down the street, hey, what do you guys think? Should we go church today? I mean, they're, they're loading their boat for the lake. What do you think they're going to tell you? See, these are not a substitute for the word of God, for prayer, for corporate worship. It's not a substitute. When we try to mix a little of the world's theology with biblical truths to create a modern day socially acceptable version of God's standard of righteousness, then we may look like a church. We're going to sound like a church. We're even going to have acts of worship like a church. But in the end, it's going to cost people their lives. People will die thinking they're doing right. So let me show you what we're doing. Tina and I have been saying this for 30 years. We are literally not just damning them. We're doubly damning them. 
You're damned if, you, if you're doing wrong. You're doubly damned if you think you're doing right while you're doing wrong. So, you know, I mean, David's just leading these people. They're worshiping that, but they're doing the same thing that the enemy does. So, let's look at, let's look at man of the people number three. Man, the man of the people number three, King David, again. <laughs> it was like, I thought we were going to go to a good king. King David again. So let's look at King David again. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So uh, here's the thing. If we're not careful, the enemy's voice, he will, he, will, he will disguise his voice to sound just like the Lord's. Because in, in, in 2 Samuel's version of this very same thing, it says the Lord incited. And you're like, wait, what? The Lord incited? But you, let me... But when we read First Chronicles version, then we see that the enemy wanted to make sure that he sounded like the Lord. So he incited uh, 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 David to number Israel. Remember, we don't need to be numbering how many we have because that puts faith into the thing that, 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 that we don't need faith in. You know, I don't need to go into battle based on what, you know, based on my, my, my military status. I need to go in battle spiritually according to the, the man who works through me. So David did this and it was against the council. He says, hey, Joab, commander of his armies, I want you to go and number the people. Joab's like, please, king, don't do this. This is not of the Lord. You're not hearing the Lord. I'm telling you. See, sometimes somebody's telling us and we're not listening. Don't do this. Please don't do this. See, the man of the people will always have more power and authority than the commander of the king's armies. So the man, the man of the people, his influence was greater. See, remember, everything leadership flows down. Verse 5, And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all Israel there were a million point one. 1.1 million who drew, who drew the sword. And in Judah, there was 470,000. So we got one and a half million swordsmen. So you could see that the army's grown quite a bit. So we've got 1.5 million soldiers. David trusted in his army more than the presence of God. You know what? When you count, see, because when I count everything that, that, that is, is, is in my arsenal, then I know if I can stand before that enemy coming or not. How many they got? Well, they got 2 million coming. I don't know. We better back out of this fight. I mean, you know, how many they, they, they have? They have 300,000. Okay, we have plenty. Let's go against them. See, we can choose whether or not we want to go into battle based upon our numbers. So he looked at what God had built, David did, and he counted it really as his own accomplishment. 1.5 million swordsmen, whom shall I fear? I mean, see, the, it just doesn't, it, we're not, we're not going to sing that on Sunday mornings. 1.5 million swordsmen, whom shall I fear? No, we're not going to sing it that way. I'm going to fear, you know, I've got the Lord. The Lord is my, my shepherd. I shall not want. He's the one that's going to lead me. Why would the Lord lead us? Why would a shepherd lead us through dark places and dangerous places to get us to better pastures? So the men of the people, mentality. The man of the people mentality, it makes God angry. He doesn't like it. So he gave David three choices. He says, look, I didn't tell you to do this. Three years of famine, three months of defeat at, at, at the hands of your enemies, or three days of pestilence or death at the hand of God. So David says, I'm, I'm not falling in the hands of the, of the enemy. I've, I've messed up. I know that this was flesh-driven, Satan-driven, I'm sorry I dishonored you, but I'm not falling in the hands of man, so you, you do with me what you wish. So when David counted these fighting men, he became a man of the people rather than a man of God. And it cost 70,000 people their lives. 70, this was a three-day period, guys. 70,000 people. It was so overwhelming and so horrific that even God himself relented and said, Hey, angel of death, Stop. He's sword drawn. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand right here. You tell me to go. I'm going to start going again. It's my job. I'm obedient to the Lord. God's like, we got to stop. So when God stops the massacre, <laughs> it's massacre. So let's look at the man of God, number four. 
uh, I mean the man of the people, number four. The man of the people, number four, we're going to change it to the exalt people. We're going to change it to the man of God. His name is King David. This time we changed it because I'm going to show you what it looks like when we, when we stand under the presence of the Lord. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2. We're going to go back to Obed-Edom's. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. Your job, my job is, is, is to be a worshiper in my house. Not the television, not the iPad. Not, I'm, it, it's, it's my job to be the priest in my home. Verse 12, and he said to them, I'm going to pull you Levites. Here, look at me, look at, look at me right in my eye. You are the heads of the fathers of the houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves. In other words, you're not going to be able to spread the gospel if you're not spreading the gospel. Consecrate yourself because let me tell you something. Words are cheap. So if you expect that, 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 that you're going to make a difference, then be a difference maker. Consecrate yourselves. Seek the Lord. Find Him so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Verse 13, because we didn't do it right the first time. I'm paraphrasing. We didn't do it right the first time. I should have never asked the people. I should have inquired of the Lord. I should have asked God, how do you say, because I'm not going to treat you like the world treats you. How do you say that I need to bring your presence into my life? The Lord broke out against us because we didn't do it right the first time. And I'm not going to treat... We are never to treat the presence of the Lord as common. So this time David set before the Lord priest and he said, burn the cart because this is not our theology. This is not who we are. You know what? The presence of the Lord is never supposed to be put on a thing. It's supposed to be put on a shoulder. And give me 12, give me 12, one from each tribe, three, 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 three. And you guys hoist the presence of the Lord because the presence of the Lord has to touch us or we're not going to be changed. So the priest before the Lord, worshipers before the Lord, sacrifice. They took six steps. Okay, we're stopping. What? Wait, what? We're going to worship. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to have sacrifice. We're going to do this for six steps until we get to there. Oh my gosh. I know what it's like to do it the wrong way, and I'm not doing it the wrong way ever again. And then when they reach the city gates, David takes his clothes off and dances before the Lord. You say, what kind of king acts like that? His own wife said, what kind of king acts like that? Well, the one we're reading about, the man of God. Because let me tell you something. When God says, when God says move in this fashion, if we don't move in this fashion, we become a, a man of the people. When we become a man of the people, then the people become the man. Their voice is the thing that, rule, that rules. So I want, to, I want to land the plane. I want you to notice something. When Saul was anointed king by Samuel, it was with a flask. It's, you know, flask is something man-made. He said, take your flask of oil and anoint Saul as king. I've chosen him. So you say, okay, big deal. See, the next time we see him at his coronation, he's, he's been anointed in private. Just, just right there but we're going to make it public that you are the king. You're the very first king of Israel. Okay, let's all make this announcement. Saul is the king. Where's Saul? He's hiding in the linen closet. He's hiding in the baggage closet. He's hiding in the supply room. He's hiding in the shed because physically he was a big dude, impressive, but, but leadership-wise, spiritually, he was pretty weak. He, his anxiety got the best of him. I can't do this. See, when David was anointed king, there's a difference. God says, take your horn of oil. See, when Saul was anointed king, nothing had to die. When David was anointed king, something had to die in order for him, that anointing to be poured upon him. So David was anointed because so, through, through, through already a, a sacrifice. And the next time we see him, he's an armor bearer to the king. He's worshiping before the king and he's killing a giant that everybody else is afraid of. The only one. The only one, the only one that would stand up among everybody. So we know they got a couple hundred thousand and he's the only one. 
So why would Saul fail God and God reject him and David fail God and God not reject David? I think it all goes back to the anointing. When Saul was in on the king, he was chasing donkeys. You can read all this in a book. It's out there. It's a good book, by the way. When David was anointed king, he was shepherding sheep. God says, I'm looking upon the heart. I'm not looking upon, I, I don't choose like you choose. Because if I ask you how you think I should choose, we're going to make a man of the people decision. But we're going to ask the Lord. Saul's heart was grounded in chaos and fear. David's was, was grounded simply in the presence of God. You could tell where a man's going by watching where he's been. In other words, David was going this way because David became just a, a, a larger portion of, of what he already was. He was a shepherd. He became a shepherd. Saul was a donkey chaser. And he became chaotic in his, in, in his reign. God is looking for a man that will please the... Uh, God is not looking for a man that will please the people. He's looking for a man with a heart after God. So stand with me, please. I want to challenge you to a thought. Let me, let me just clarify to make sure we're not, we're not, we're not. Godly counsel is in perfect order. Godly counsel is in perfect order. However, we can't seek godly advice from people who aren't godly. Here's an example. A secular marriage counselor will say to you, and believe me, I've seen it. We've never been to a marriage council. It's not us, but I've, I've watched it. I've seen it. I, see what, I saw what it did. A secular marriage counselor will say, you need to do what makes you feel good. If it means you divorce him, then you need to divorce him because you need to take care of yourself. You're the, you're the most important thing. A Christian marriage counselor will say, you need to do what's best for this marriage. You may need to separate things from your life that you don't need. Your, 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 your marriage needs sacrifice. It needs prayer. It needs study together. This is the difference. Because I saw one that is not with us anymore. They're dead and gone. Because they did what they felt what like was right. See, we can't get that kind of input. It will cost lives. This kind of input saves lives, saves marriages, and continues forward. Chasing the heart of God will never be popular with the people who aren't chasing after God. So... Let me ask you to do something with me. I want to ask you. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to ask this question. There has been one attack on top of another this past week. I mean, it has been attack after attack after attack. We need to realize that God's, that there's a reason. There's a reason why there was a storm on the way across the Sea of, of, of Galilee to get to the Decapolis. So one demon-possessed man, one could be, hit, could, could be uh, delivered because the man completely spread the gospel to the Decapolis by himself. So why would the, the enemy fight so hard this week? Maybe you don't want you to hear this sermon. Maybe he don't want you to be here. Maybe want, maybe maybe want you to listen to his voice more than the voice of the Lord. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm just going to tell you this. We need to find that place where we can hunger after God's righteousness. And there is a place, godly counsel speaking into our lives, people praying with us into our hearts and our lives. That's what's going to make a difference. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to pray a sinner's prayer with me. You may have not ever prayed this before in your lives, but I'm going to ask you to pray it with me. And you, you're like, I have no idea what we're doing. It's okay. David had never been king before either. And you see that he messed up some things, but God didn't abandon him. So it's okay to not know how to walk with the Lord because none of us do until we start. So I want to ask you to do this with me. Pray this prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my heart to forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I welcome salvation that can only come from you through the cross, through, through your resurrection. I am made whole. So I am excited to be able to say, I am a child of the King. In your name I pray. Amen.
with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, did you 